For as long as I remember, I have said there are three things impossible to me. To marry an American, to live to or to marry a parson, or to live permanently outside of London. And here I am, married to the Americanest American, and living 6,000 miles from London. The only thing left to make my abdication complete is for William to turn parson. <laughs> I shall never forget the stress I was in when William was here and I was in London. Suddenly, William's letters, which came as a rule, once a week in batches of threes and fours, ceased. I waited one mail, patiently enough, thinking that they had missed a ship or had not been able to make a connection. But by the fourth, I, I was panic-stricken. I knew exactly what had happened. He had been having fever, and there was no one to look after him, and it had turned to black fever, and no one liked to tell me. Just as I was ready to flee to London, on to await the worst, the post arrived. Four good, hearty letters from William. Not a word about fever or anything of its kind. William had booked transportation for my passage on the Olympic. And I had two days in New York before I caught the steamer down to Panama on the 25th of May, 1914. I found William, who had left London a month earlier and gone across the States to New Orleans on business, waiting for me in Cologne. There we bought some necessities and started for home, a night's journey back <coughs> along the coast towards Costa Rica. Most of those who arrived from the north departed from New York, New Orleans, or from the terminus of Mr. Flagler's new overseas railroad in Key West. There, steamships were fitted out with shady decks and private cabins. There were onboard recreation and dances in the ship's public rooms. The journey from New York to Cologne was eight days with a 24-hour stop in Jamaica. The West Indian workers made the 500-mile journey from Barbados on small ships crowded with hundreds of men for a fare of five dollars. They slept on the open decks and shared any food they had brought aboard as none was provided for them. At night, they would sing hymns accompanied by accordions, fiddlers, and mouth organs. Many came seeking adventure, but most were fleeing poverty at home with the hopes of putting their skills to work and returning to their families with imagined riches. Almost two-thirds of them would never return home. Next morning, I awoke to brilliant sunlight. This was my wedding day. In a daze, I heard the time-worn words. I felt the gold band slipped on my finger, and I realized we were man and wife. Charlie kissed me, and we turned to greet our guests. They were Charlie's friends, all of them. But in a few minutes, I knew they were mine, too. Across the railroad track we walked, hand in hand, the Big Dipper low in the sky behind us, the Southern Cross just above the horizon toward which we faced. Soon, we stopped in front of a little bungalow the same drab color and the same shape as all the others we had passed. Charlie carried me over the threshold in time-approved fashion. With his arm around me, he led me through the little cottage. Two rooms, two enclosed porches, a tiny bath, and a tiny kitchen. 